Well, I want to welcome and thank you all for being here tonight um, on yet maybe another snowy night. It seems like all, all Wednesdays and town hall meetings there's snow. Um, I'm just so thankful for the moisture though. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but the last two very scary red flag warning days have been a little tiring. Don't like that. And so tonight we're talking about why we're here or why we're here tonight is to be pre-wildfire uh, pre prepared for post-wildfire impact. So we've got a lot of speakers talking about that, and I think you're gonna enjoy the, the lineup of speakers. I'd like to give out a very special thanks to Mountain Metro Association of Realtors. They're up here with the blue table five. And also Remax Alliance for their community support of tonight's town hall meeting. We really appreciated them being here. We'd also like to thank My Mountain Town for videotaping tonight's meeting. It will be on Mount, My Mountain Town. And then for Conifer Jazzercise for providing water tonight. So thank you to them. A link will be available in the next day or two for you to view the meeting again. And for anybody that is not here to meet, um, view it for the first time. So be watching for that link. And if you have not signed up for a Conifer Area Council um, email list, be sure and do that and then you'll get that list and that link. So our speakers tonight have been asked to present just the facts, not in support or in opposition of any development, person, place, anything like that. Um, also, there will be no campaigning. You did hopefully meet some of the candidates for the Elk Creek election out in the foyer, um, but there's no com campaigning in the cafetorium. Most of you have been here before several times, a lot of you, so thank you for that. Um, if you have not been here before, there are no comments, questions, anything during the presentations. Um, but then afterwards, we do have an open house, um, just like the, the one that we've had for the last hour, where you can talk to any of the speakers, the candidates, and all of that. So that'll be coming up pretty soon. That'll be about 8 o'clock. So what is going on around here? We're going to do um, just a very few community updates first before we start talking about the, the wildfire preparedness. Um, first of all, we have Jessica Paulson, Public Services Manager with Mountain Libraries. Um, she's going to give happenings at the Conifer Library and Conifer Library update. Jessica. Thanks, Shirley. Hi, everyone. Is the microphone working? Okay. Um, many of you have asked me already tonight about the project we have called Library Services for Conifer. You may have known that we've budgeted $2.5 million to take a look at services here in the community this year. Um, the first step of that was to do some stakeholder interviews, which we've completed, and a market analysis. And both of those things have been compiled and are going to our Board of Trustees at the next meeting, which is tomorrow night at 5.30. There's a virtual and in-person option if you're interested. Uh, the next step as part of that process is to hold community input meetings for everyone to be involved and so that we can hear all of your voices. Um, we're going to have a survey in May um, that will be available online and in person at the library. And then we're going to do an in-person meeting at 10 a.m. on Saturday, May 13th, and a virtual meeting on Monday, May 15th at 7 p.m. Um, the content will be similar. Um, you'll go to one or the other. Um, you don't need to go to both, but we would very much love to have your voice and your engagement, so please put those on your calendars. Um, we'll be sharing the word um, through flyers and on our website and through a direct mail postcard. Um, something else that we're going to do again this year, we piloted for, for the first time last summer, is to have daytime hours. Um, we've worked with the schools to be able to use the library during the day again during the summer. So from May 28th through August 12th, uh, we will be open from 10 to 6 on Monday and Thursdays, 12 to 8 on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and nine to five on Saturdays and Sundays. We will remain closed on Fridays as we are now. Um, and then just my usual program updates for what, what is happening at the library. We've got all of our normal um, art house and Dungeons and Dragons and story time events happening as usual. Um, but we've also got a couple of new ones. One's called What's That Bird in My Backyard? Um, there's an environmental educator who will be facilitating that program on Saturday, April 22nd. 
Um, and then Paint Your Stress Away is for teens. It's just an opportunity to hang out and listen to music um, and do something sort of mindless and creative. So that'll be on Wednesday, May 3rd. So um, I'll be hanging around afterwards. If you have any questions, come find me. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. So next, I would like to welcome our new um, director of the Conifer Area Chamber of Commerce, um, Beth Schneider. Beth, welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Beth Schneider, and as you know, I'm the new director of the Conifer Area Chamber of Commerce. I am just thrilled to be working with this amazing group of people, and I'm committed to helping the chamber and our community grow and thrive for years to come. Um, I am officially one month into the job and uh, am loving every minute of it. Uh, we have, we're working on some really fantastic events at the moment. We have our community directory that we're assembling all of the content for that. That will be published probably in early June and everyone will receive that of course in the mail. Um, we have our awards uh, that's happening tomorrow night where we will be honoring the top businesses as well as uh, community leaders and celebrating all the successes. Um, it's a 20s flapper theme, so it's sure to be a really fun evening. And uh, keep an eye out for some photos and an article about that in the Your Mountain Connection paper. Um, and of course, mark your calendars for the uh, Elevation Celebration happening on July 29th and 30th. Um, please do reach out if you are interested in participating or volunteering in that event. We need uh, all the help that we can get to make it a very successful weekend. And again, thank you so much for having me here, and I look forward to getting to know you and working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. And I'd like to welcome back um, our RTD director, um, Peggy Catlin. She hasn't been able to be with us all the time, but she has an RTD report tonight. Peggy. Thank you, Shirley. Um, RTD is all about mobility, and I've had some mobility challenges since January, so uh, this is nice to actually be in front of you again. <clears throat> now, I have several slides up here, and I won't go through all of the details of them, but the PowerPoint presentation will be available, um, and Shirley can give that to you. Um, some of you do go down the hill and take the W line into um, into downtown Denver, and are probably aware of, of the derailment that we had that resulted in some damage to the facility. And the good news is that we should have service fully rest fully restored no later than May 8th. So that's coming up pretty quick. Next slide, please. Um, another thing that we've been doing, uh, we've heard a lot of people comment that our fair structure is very, very complicated and, and just hard to use. And so we've been undergoing a, a, a study to simplify and flatten out our fares. And I think the good news for those of you who live up here in Conifer is that, that the regional fair structure will probably be going away and it will be more of a flat rate structure. Next slide, please. Um, one of the other things that we've done is really tried to reach out to our partners, um, our, our local governments, uh, county commissioners, et cetera, to try and develop some partnerships to better improve mobility to areas like the mountain community. So we, um, we're, we developed some service area councils, and there are, are five of them, and Jefferson County is one of them, and we're working with Leslie and her group to try and and, and get those going. So there, there is some money associated with that and we um, will be doing some pilot projects. And the last thing I'd like to talk about is something we've called Respect the Ride. A number of years ago we had a um, code of conduct and we've been trying to uh, update that. Um, there's been a lot of concern raised about some of the unhoused and some unwelcome behaviors of many of our facilities, so we were trying to revise the code of conduct. That is currently under review. Um, public comment is appreciated. We'll be probably voting on that in the June time frame. So that's it. If you have any questions, I'm available afterwards. Thank you. 
Thank you, Peggy. And now, um, CDOT was unable to come up tonight, but Marilyn Salzman, one of our CAC board members, is going to give a report from Brian at CDOT. Thanks, Shirley. So they have given us updates on four different issues. One is the Kings Valley project. The consultant is currently gathering traffic counts doing a field survey and underground utility information to better inform the design. The project is will be 30% designed by August of this year. The project team will be able to provide a better picture of what the project looks like at this stage. Uh, in the meantime, if you're interested, you can go to the codot.gov website and search for any project you might be interested in and you can find more information. Uh, they recently did a speed study of 285 um, what they're recommending is that the speed be reduced from 55 to 45 miles per hour between Richmond Hill, just east of Kings Valley in the northbound lanes, and from southbound from Richmond Hill to Schaefer's Crossing. So new speed signs will be going up this summer. Good luck. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, pavement condition near Richmond Hill. Northbound US 285 near mile marker 231. There's a segment of pavement where the road was undercut due to road runoff, and their um, maintenance crews have filled in the area where the road was undercut. They'll also be repairing the asphalt curb in that area. Uh, 285 at Bailey. This project will install concrete barriers in the center median, a guardrail along the river, upgrading turn lanes, adding rumble strips, and enhancing roadway signage, including an overhead sign for southbound traffic. Construction is scheduled to begin in June of this year with completion in September. That's the CDOT update, thanks. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, so next, um, Beaver Ranch Community Park, you all know, I'm sure, and love. Um, there's some major improvements coming to Beaver Ranch Community Park, and Wyatt Yates, who is the president of um, the board is here to tell you a little bit about that. Wyatt. So Beaver Ranch Community is a local nonprofit that jointly manages Beaver Ranch Park with Jefferson County Open Space. And it's a very exciting time. We, with the county, went out in 2017 and put a master plan together with the park to, for the long-term vision of what the park's going to look like and we are now nearing the final stages of that. The county is currently in the process of picking a contractor um, and that's going to be doing major infrastructure improvements to the park and with that the nonprofit is in the process of fundraising for a new public playground. Um, so we've set money aside for the last several years um, for that and we're now going out to the public for donations as well as going after grant dollars for the project. Um, so we have updated our website to include a lot of information about the playground as, long as, as well as some initial designs. The playground we're looking to build will be almost three times larger than the existing playground there. It will be accessible to all. It will have some more shade structures if you've been there. You know, as the playground's in a very exposed area, there's no shade around there. Um, so we're going to have some shade structures and incorporate shade into the design of the final playground. But uh, you can go to our website at beaverranch.org slash playground and you can see all the drawings we have, survey you can fill out there, as well as do donations. You can sign up to help um, with the campaign. Um, and then we also have a link to the master plan with the county uh, on our website. It's just beaverranch.org on our homepage. So thank you. Thank you, Wyatt. Um, okay, so next we're going to start talking about wildfire, um, pre-wildfire preparedness for post-wildfire impact. Um, and next we have um, Heather Gutherless, um, Cassidy Clements, and Commissioner Leslie Dalcamper going to be talking about several things, um, but the comprehensive plan and regulations update, which is underway, a big deal, including wildfire regulations. We'll talk about high interest conifer plan developments. And then um, Cassidy will be talking about short term rental regulations related to wildfire and more. So I think Heather's going to start this off. Heather. Yes, I am. Thank you. 
Good to be back here again tonight. Good to see such a good turnout. It always is. You, this is a wonderful venue to be at. Tonight, I'm going to start with some of our development proposals. I know a lot of times I start with the other bigger projects. I'm going to go briefly over this because we do have a couple bigger things that we wanted to talk about tonight. There are 26 active development cases in the conifer area right now. There are actually have been no new pre-applications since the last meeting in February, but there have been two new community meetings that then went into two new rezoning applications. Those two applications I'm actually not going to talk about, but they are in the development report. I also have an updated development report that I just printed out yesterday that will be over at our table after the presentation. There's also one new special use case, which is the uh, Shadow Mountain Bike Park, which I'm sure everybody will be very interested in. So the rezoning and the special use process is very similar. The, the only difference is slightly different criteria for special uses. But there are four opportunities for public input during a rezoning and a special use case. It starts out with the community meeting. The community meeting occurs before a formal application, and that is an opportunity for the applicant to explain their proposal to the community and get feedback. Then, if a formal application is submitted, the applicant sends out, well, the county, on behalf of the applicant, sends out postcards and posts signs on the property, sends information out to referral agencies, and at that point, there is a good opportunity for a public to provide written comments on the application. Then, there is a process where we might have multiple referrals. Once the case comes to a point where staff and the applicant agree, or we agree to disagree, then there are hearings scheduled. There are two hearings. One is before the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission is an advisory body that focuses on land use cases. There is an opportunity at that hearing for public testimony. They also receive a packet full of any comments that might have been received up to that point. Then there is a Board of County Commissioners hearing. The Board of County Commissioners is the final decision maker on both rezoning and special use cases. Like the Planning Commission, there is opportunity for public testimony at those hearings, and again, comments are in their case packet. I wanted to talk about all of that because I, the two cases that I am going to talk about I know are very high interest, and so I know that there is a lot of interest in how you can get involved at, in different stages of the process. With the Shadow Mountain Bike Park, it has come in for a formal application. They are in their first referral period. So now is the time to make comments to the case manager. If you want to submit comments, Dylan Monk's name is on the screen and his email address. And so I would encourage you to email him any comments. They would get put into the case packet. And just for anybody that might not be familiar, this is for a, a proposal for a special use for a lift-served mountain bike park up on Shadow Mountain Drive. The first referral, there was a, a glitch where the referral went out to the referral agencies, but the signs didn't get posted on the property, so it has been extended. The referral due date has been extended to May 5th, so keep that in mind. And then the other rezoning that I know is of high interest is, or the rezoning that is of high interest, is the property that is behind the Safeway, that is just east of the Safeway, in the Conifer Center, that was the proposal for 188 residential units and some recreational areas. This property has gone through a lot of the rezoning process, but they are currently in the court process. They had to resolve some issues with the courts, and so it has kind of been put on hold for a while, and the case manager is waiting to hear back from the applicant. Next, I'm going to hand it over to Cassidy to talk about short-term rentals. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here tonight. Um, so I will talk to you about our short-term rental regulation update. I am the case manager for this regulation update. And as I'm sure you all know, we had some community meetings uh, previously last summer, and then we started the process uh, in 2019 going into 2020. So when we started the process in 2019 slash 2020, we had to put a pause on the process because of COVID-19. We couldn't have in-person community meetings. 
and we were still figuring out what community outreach looked like. Looked like. Um, and during that time, we kind of realized some issues that needed to be addressed. Um, so we have put a pause on our short-term rental regulation update, rolling them out to put some process improvements in place. One of those process improvements is putting out a request for information uh, to see how we can hire a third party to complete our permit compliance and monitoring because we do not have the capacity at the county level to complete the monitoring um, and compliance for these short-term rentals. Uh, so right now we are gathering input and so with that gathering input process we have some nice boards over there that I would love if you all could stop by. Uh, we have stickers you can put on them, post, post it notes, you can write on them, whatever you want. I just want your opinion. So please feel free to go read those and let me know your thoughts. Thank you so much. And then we are going to hear from Commissioner Dahl Kemper about wildfire and this does not go with her presentation. <laughs> Hi everyone, how are you tonight? It's great to see you. Thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for caring about the Conifer community and also about the wildfire threat that we face here in Jefferson County. Heather and I thought we would tag team for a couple of different reasons. One, just last week we had a meeting of the Colorado Fire Commission, which meets quarterly. I'm one of two county commissioners appointed to that board by the governor. And I wanted to share some highlights coming out of the Colorado Fire Commission because they're not only good for the state, but they're good for Jefferson County. And next, I wanted to talk very briefly and recognize the tremendous work that our former Jeffco Risk Reduction Wildfire Task Force did in terms of recommendations to the Board of County Commissioners. We have now identified a pot of funding uh, that includes one-time dollars from the American Rescue Plan Act, from the Department of Natural Resources, there are even some dollars from the Colorado Health Department uh, that will help us launch a major initiative that Heather is going to go into more detail about. But we wanted to make sure you knew that that initiative was based largely on the work of the task force. We still have some outlying issues we need to address around GIS mapping, past, present, and future mitigation projects as well as strategic communications and how do we leverage all of these incredible communication networks we have throughout Jeffco to raise awareness and always push out good, timely, relevant communications about reducing wildfire risk and more. But we're very excited about the planning and zoning work we're doing, CWPP, again, other issues that Heather will talk about in just a moment. Real quick, related to the Colorado Fire Commission, First, I want to give a shout out to Representative Story, who I know is speaking uh, here in a few minutes. She carried legislation that will create the Wildfire Awareness Campaign. And that campaign will take place in three counties, including some statewide work as well. But one of those three counties is Jefferson County. It is a public awareness campaign that is about to get underway. We're really excited about that effort. Also, from the Colorado Fire Commission, we work throughout the year on recommendations that we bring to legislators, like Senator Cutter, Representative Story, and many others. And we were very excited to see that all of the recommendations coming out of the Colorado Fire Commission were included in the governor's budget. Those recommendations um, included earlier a Firehawk. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the Firehawk? Uh, it is a retrofitted Black Hawk helicopter used to fight wildfires, and we're really proud that it's going to be housed at the Jeffco Airport. That is a big deal for, for uh, us and other counties as, as well. Uh, we're also putting in place a new data platform statewide. We didn't have one before to really give us the data points we need to better understand uh, wildfire and other fire-related issues. We're also uh, improving fire investigations. In Colorado, we have only one full-time employee who conducts fire investigations. The dollars in the governor's budget will increase that to seven staff members who will work around the state as well. Another big area we've been working on, I'll mention briefly, is the Wildfire Resiliency Code Board. We've been working on this for two years with our fire chiefs and other advocates. Senator Cutter has really led the charge on that with Senator Exum. And uh, we just testified um, 
yesterday, I think it was, in front of the House Committee and the bill passed. This is an effort to harden homes. We know from FEMA that it is the most effective strategy in ensuring you have a home to return to if there is a wildfire in your community, along with all those other good strategies. Directly tied to this issue is a bill by Representative Snyder that would set aside $2 million in grants to help homeowners harden their homes. If you're changing out your, your deck or your roof, uh, those dollars will help with that as well. Other areas include big improvements in terms of mutual aid among fire rescue agencies and much more. Last but not least, we're also excited to hear from Director Mike Morgan with the Department of Fire Prevention and Control. He serves on a national wildfire commission, so we hit it at all three levels, national, state, and local. And he also shared with us at the Colorado Fire Commission that more federal dollars are on the way, specifically uh, to harden homes and for other efforts as well. So a lot happening at all three levels. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Heather to share more about a new initiative that we have underway that uh, will also help with this very same work right here in Jeffco. Thank you all very much. So last time I was here, I talked a little bit about the plan and regulation update and how it was underway. In March, the Board of County Commissioners approved county staff uh, a contract for county staff to partner with Logan Simpson to start our plan and regulation process update. And this is a really exciting process. It's a really exciting time to be a Jefferson County resident because this is going to be a very involved and cooperative process between our comprehensive master plan, transportation master plan, our community wildfire protection plan, our eva an evacuation annex, creating an all hazards evacuation annex, and then updating and consolidating some of our regulations into a unified land use code. It's a very exciting process, and I do want to note that Commissioner Dahlkemper was talking about federal funding. 90% of the funding for this project comes from American Rescue Plan Act funds. So your federal tax dollars are going to benefit specifically your community. So I think that's also a really exciting aspect of this. Tonight, as you come over and look and talk about short-term rentals with Cassidy, we hope that you'll also look at some of the other boards that we have that ask for input about your vision for the future of Jeffco and also what some of the challenges are. We're also looking at a name for this large project to unify it. We have some options over there that we would love to have you vote on uh, after, the, after all of the presentations, so please come and see us. I also wanted to put this screen up. There is a way to start being, to make sure that you're notified of this right now. We have Notify Me listservs through the county that are for county plan and regulation updates. So please sign up for those. I have handouts to, so that the, you can actually read what's on the screen. There are handouts for that and that information is over there. We really hope that we can get a lot of people involved in this. It's really an exciting project going to encompass a lot of things, and we hope to see you at meetings in the future. That concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. So many exciting things happening, and you can have so much fun with stars and stickers and stuff, so please go over and put your information up there. So next we have Chief Sherlaw Ware and Rogers with Inner Canyon, Elk Creek, and North Fork Fire Departments. Um, they're doing a lot of preseason work right now. A lot of it's underway. Um, so pro probably a lot of you are already involved in some of that. But they're going to talk a little bit about that and then a little bit about the consolidation um, of departments. Okay. Thank you, Shirley. Thanks for having us here tonight. Um, thank you, Angela. So we're going to talk, um, as uh, Shirley said, we're going to talk to you a little bit about early season wildfire, um, some of the consolidation issues. I'm Chief Sherlaw with Inner Canyon, here with uh, Chief Ware from Elk Creek and Chief Rogers from North Fork. And wildfire season is here. Well, wildfire really happens all year round for us, we know that. But we have already been responding on local fire incidents in our area. So we're starting to get those early season fires starting up. 
And many of you might be thinking, well, it's been a really wet winter. We've had a lot of snow, which is true, and that's great. But that also means that we have more fuels. And they're growing quite a bit, and they're readily available for fire. So a lot of weather, or a lot of wet weather, means some more fuels. We're starting to dry out a little bit, so we're most likely going to see the possibility of more fires coming up. And with that, we also want to let you know that our seasonals have come on board. So that's great news. That means that we're adding more personnel to our uh, wildfire team. They're in the process of pre-season training right now. They're coming in getting their, um, getting all their qual set, getting out there, working together. So they're coming together for the season as well. So we're gonna have more resources available. And the last thing I wanna talk about before I turn it over to Chief Rogers is you're also probably wondering or concerned about what you can do for your own home or your own community. Well, we encourage you to go onto our websites or over to one of the uh, tables over there where we have some information about wildfire prepared assessments. It's a very in-depth uh, assessment with a professional coming to your home. It's going to spend a lot of time with you and not only just talk about your property, talk about your house and really go into depth about the science behind fire. So we encourage you to go over there also to talk to our ambassadors. And I'm going to turn it over to Chief Wayne. Close, cheap projects. Um, we all like the same. Uh, hey, I just want to thank you for having us again here tonight. Um, last uh, meeting here, we did a, a quick slide presentation on consolidation. Um, and we're in the midst now of holding um, a bunch of open houses. Um, we've held a couple already. The next one coming up is going to be next Tuesday at Inner Canyon Station 3. Um, right by Windy Point there is the fire station that's by Windy Point there. Um, we really encourage you to come out and talk to us at these meetings. We have good representation from board members, firefighters, chiefs, and paramedics at these meetings. And it's a great opportunity to come and ask us questions as we're moving forward considering consolidation. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to Chief Ware for a minute here. Um, he was gonna talk about some election stuff yeah, um, I'm Chief Ware with Elk Creek Fire. Uh, Elk Creek right now, we have a board election coming up. Please vote. Historically, we have very low voter turnout for these things. Out of our population of nearly 17,000, we don't get more than a few thousand votes. Voting is very important. Uh, absentee ballots, the ballot request forms are due by April 25th. I even have some if you can't make it. All ballots are due to the designated election official by May 2nd. Voting is at Elk Creek Station 1 on May 2nd, um, so please get the vote out. A lot of the candidates are here tonight. Um, I think they were, they'll were they be out afterwards talking, so please get out, meet the candidates, and vote. It's critically important. That's all I got. I think we're even under time, right, Angela? Yes. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. I just told them they were short and they're all tall, so that was really stupid. Um, <laughs> but it was a short presentation. Thank you for doing that. Um, okay, next we have um, uh, Scott Posick, who is the commander up here, and he's going to kind of represent the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. He's talking about fire response and notifications from the Sheriff's Office. Scott. Thank you. So maybe their presentation was short, but I'm short. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about um, a, a campaign that we started oh, about a year ago, and it kind of touches on what um, what uh, Skip Sherlock was talking about, and that is um, being prepared. You know, as as the chief said, fire season really is all year round, right? It's it used to be the summer months, but it's really all year round. So. What we started was Be Your Own Hero, and this was a campaign we started with the Sheriff's Office and Fire Departments in what you can do to be your own hero when it comes to wildland fire. And so first of all, and I'll talk a little bit, bit, a little bit more about the lookout alert um, in a few more slides, but, but uh, registering for lookout alert is number one, Num the first thing you could do to, um, to be prepared for wildland fire. Um, next is, uh, being prepared is to prepare for um, to evacuate so as as mentioned earlier and I think there's probably some information over at the tables is um, 
making sure that, that you're preparing your home as well for, for um, evacuations. So first thing is, if you're in danger, if you feel you're in danger, if you see smoke or, or smell smoke, see fire, get out, leave. Don't wait to be told to leave. Don't wait for the evacuation, but please leave. Um, and then next is know the three types of evacuation. Uh, first is shelter in place, and that oftentimes is, is the safest, particularly in an event that's maybe not a wildland fire, but maybe some sort of a law enforcement type of, of an event or an incident. The next is pre-evacuation, and that is being prepared to leave. So don't wait to, to get that evacuation to get your things together. Be prepared ahead of time. And then last is evacuation, and that means when you get that, that notification to evacuate, leave immediately. So next is um, being, being ready. So I talked a minute ago about preparing your, your, the space around your home. We talk about that 30 foot of defensible space around your home, clearing trees and shrubs and that sort of thing. And again, I'm sure there's a lot of information that they'll be providing later on. Um, next is um, when it's time to leave, to evacuate, don't wait, leave immediately. And again, if you feel you're in danger, please leave. And then last is um, the five P's to consider when, evacu when, when evacuating. Um, first is keeping in mind people and pets are first and foremost. You can replace other things, but if it's time to leave and you don't have time, particularly if you have small kids or elderly folks that is going to take additional time to evacuate, take that into consideration. If you have time to grab your prescriptions, to grab papers and, and personal items or priceless items, then evaluate that. But again, if, if, if you have time. And then talking a little bit about the lookout alert. I'm sure everybody is familiar with the lookout alert system. That's our county's notification system. So you get the, the message through our Jeffcom. Um, and, I, and I'll have some flyers um, in the back on, on how to register for lookout alert. So see me afterward if you do not have that. It's the best way to get the notifications from, from the Sheriff's Office or from JeffCom when there is an emergency. Um, we will notify of, of any natural or man-made type disasters or even um, law enforcement type activities. Um, we'll notify whether it's an evacuation or a shelter in place through that alert system. And then we'll notify of if, if there is other law enforcement type activities. We often use the lookout alert when we have lost, lost or missing um, people, whether it's kids or elderly. And it's been a great tool for us. It's been very, very successful. Um, severe weather notifications, you'll get that through lookout alert. And I'm gonna mention a little bit more on that in just a second. So again, I'll have um, information on registration, but if you have a landline, um, and some people still have landlines. Your, your landline is automatically in the lookout alert system. But if you don't, if you have a mobile phone um, or other devices, you have to go in and register those devices. Um, it's extremely important. Um, you will you'll identify on how you want to be notified of, of alerts, whether it's through a text message, phone, emails. Um, and then it's really important if your information changes, whether it's a phone or people in your home, make sure you're updating that information and you should be doing that on, on a you know, continual basis. Um, and then again, you can, you can select on what you want to be notified of, what type of events you want to be notified of, but certainly fire events, weather events, that sort of thing. So the lookout alert, these are the ways to, to register for it. You can simply go online. There is an app, um, like there is for everything. Um, and I really encourage to select to be notified of severe weather notifications. And the reason why is because what we will be um, putting into place with, at the sheriff's office is when there is a, a red flag uh, warning, that, uh, I, in fact, we received one, I believe, earlier this week on a red flag warning. Um, when there is a red flag warning, the county will automatically go into, into stage one um, fire, fire restrictions. And that will, that will be automatic when we are in a red flag warning. So when you get that, you'll know, you'll know that, that we're in, in uh, stage one fire restrictions. With that, 
So I think that's it for me. Again, I will be in the back. I'll have some flyers on uh, Be Your Own Hero and also on the Lookout Alert uh, registration. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Scott. Um, okay, next we have Andrea Urban Monahan, watershed scientist um, with the Colorado Water Conservation Board. And she's going to be talking about wildfire ready watersheds. Really, really important. And um, I've just been hearing a little bit about what they're doing, and it's very exciting. It's amazing what they are doing. So she's going to fill you in. Thank you for having me. My name is Andrea Harbin Monahan. I am a watershed scientist with the Colorado Water Conservation Board, uh, where we are tasked with protecting, managing, and conserving the state's water resources for present and future generations. And one of the ways that we are trying to do that is through our Wildfire Ready Watersheds program. Um, this was a legislative directive from Senate Bill 21240. And with this bill, we have um, two objectives. One was to complete a state susceptibility study of Colorado's water resources, our communities, and our critical infrastructure, and um, the impacts of post-wildfire to those, and then also to advance a framework for communities to plan and implement mitigation strategies to minimize those impacts before fires occur. So our team spent the last year assessing hazards on a statewide scale, and these hazards include things like erosion and debris flows and water quality degradation um, and flooding, of course. And they also looked at our values at risk within each watershed. And those include things like life and property, which are our homes, um, road crossings, reservoirs and dams, and aquatic ecosystems. And then where those hazards meet those values at risk, that's where we are susceptible. So um, we have a website. It's called wildfirereadywatersheds.com. And on that website, there are a few output maps of that susceptibility study. And this is one of them. And you can see where Jeff Coe is right kind of in the middle of the map. And you can see where Conifer is at. And you can see that we are pretty lit relative to the rest of the state. So we are very susceptible to post-fire risk here. Um, and then also on that website, there is a statewide post-fire susceptibility explorer where you can go in, um, look at your watershed of choice. You can toggle on and off specific hazards. So you can look specifically at erosion or debris flow. Um, and then you can also look at specific values at risk. So life and property, for example, or reservoirs. And you can see how our relative susceptibility changes depending on the hazards or the assets that you're looking at. So I encourage you to go to that um, and just putz around. It's pretty interesting. So that was um, the first objective of Senate Bill 21240. And the second objective was to develop a framework to help local communities um, define what their susceptibility is and um, determine wildfire mitigation actions that we can take to reduce the risk of life, property, and infrastructure. So we call that framework a Wildfire Ready Action Plan, or a WRAP. And if you go to the wildfirereadywatersheds.com website, there is a um, pretty detailed scope of work template that is already put together. Um, it's a great resource for communities that are starting basically from scratch. Um, if there's already been some planning efforts in place, then this scope of work template can be modified to uh, fill in any gaps that might exist, or maybe you just wanna look at it more from a wildfire perspective and adjust some things, that's totally fine. But from those that are starting from scratch, um, it pretty much walks you through everything. It will, it will help you define your goals and objectives. It will walk you through the stakeholder collaboration process, help you define which stakeholders need to be at the table. It walks you through data collection, helping you to identify what data needs to be collected, where you can find it, how you can analyze the gaps that might exist in that data. 
Um, it'll walk you through the hazard analysis and the values analysis. And then the bread and butter of the scope is this pre and post fire, post wildfire mitigation activities bullet point, which this is pretty much a list of mitigation activities that we can implement before a fire happens to help mitigate those risks to our assets in our watershed. Um, so that's where we want to get to. And then I'm going to leave it on the slide for a second, but I'm going to pivot to the funding of it all. So we were given um, a bucket of $10 million to implement this program. So that is to help pay for this planning and to pay for the implementation projects that come out of that planning. So we can fund up to 75% of these wraps with local stakeholders bringing a 25% match to the table. And then once we get to that list of mitigation activities, we can fund 50% of each of those implementation projects with stakeholders bringing 50% of a match to the table. So um, the caveat with that is that we are working on a very short timeline. This funding needs to be contracted by end of cal calendar year 2024 and it needs to be spent by the end of calendar year 2026, which is kind of tight. So our goal is to get as many of these wraps on the ground, implemented, get them funded, get them finished, and get to that list of mitigation activities so that we can fund those implementation projects and get them finished before the end of 2026. So it's a little stressful, but that's where we're at. Um, Oh, the other thing I wanted to say is that these are also also ARPA funds. So with that comes all the caveats that come with federal funding. Um, that's all I'll say about that, I suppose. Um, I'm just going to blow through some of these. This is just um, an example of a project that may be... Um, Something that comes out of these wraps, these are post-assisted log structures. This is in Trail Creek, which is a tributary to the Taylor River. And these post-assisted log structures are meant to be a cost-effective way to help mitigate, um, or rather restore wetlands and degraded floodplains, because we know that resilient floodplains lead to resilient watersheds, and resilient watersheds are the best way to protect our values at risk downstream. So. With that, um, it's a beautiful, well-functioning floodplain. We love to see it. That's our goal, I suppose. Um, with that, I will stick around afterwards to answer any questions, or you can also direct questions to Chris Sturm. He's our Watershed Program Director at the CWCB, and his email will be available on the slides. So thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, a lot of stuff going on, right? So it's, it's good to hear about all this. Um, next we have um, Carmen Elam, who is the spokesperson for Mountain Metro Association of Realtors. Um, she wants to talk just a little bit about what they're doing um, regarding wildfire and you know new people understanding more about mountain living, right? <laughs> Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. We're uh, proud to be co-sponsor for this event tonight, so I'm really grateful to be here. Um, for those who may not be familiar with Mountain Metro Association of Realtors, and I'll just call it Lamar going forward, um, it's a local organization comprised of Realtor and affiliate members. When I say affiliate members, I mean um, those non-Realtor partners like inspectors, insurance companies, title companies, lenders, etc. Um, with the exception of one staff member who works for Mamar, uh, many of us uh, volunteer on our board of directors, uh, various committees like um, our wildfire committee, which is uh, represented here tonight, um, representing our mountain area specialist realtors and affiliates. Um, this uh, wildfire committee has been really busy. Uh, they've created some great community partnerships and are committed to further align with the community fire districts, um, the community ambassador program, which is also here tonight, um, to promote the wildfire prepared program. A key element in this, uh, our mission is education and awareness. Um, this applies not only to our mountain realtor and, and affiliate 
um, members, but the clients that we bring into our communities and keeping our communities safe. So um, I encourage you to please stop by um, our table over there, um, learn about all the proactive things that we're doing to assist our community's safety and education, including um, a couple of things, our involvement with the Jefferson County slash um, collection days, promotion of the community ambassador program, and uh, many other things that we're involved in. So um, we've got a lot of this information on our website at um, mountainmetro.com, and encourage you to please follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Um, the next, and we have a lot of representatives from CORE tonight. We have a, a bunch of people that will be back there um, at 8 o'clock to talk to you about a lot of things they're doing. Um, we also have Director one, Ron Kilgore, and he's going to be talking about satellite-based imaging and all kinds of wonderful things. So, Ron. Thank you, Shirley. So obviously, if we're talking about wildfire, we have to talk about power system. Uh, it's everywhere, it's going to all of our homes, and it is a potential ignition source. There are three main things that we're doing to make that potential as low as possible. The first and foremost is vegetation management, and we're also doing some kind of cool things with satellite imaging. Uh, as part of the vegetation management, we are we also, every time there's a red flag day, we change the settings on every one of the, the lines that go out to your neighborhoods. And that setting is, is to make it much more sensitive and much, more, uh, more, um, much less likely to be involved in ignition of a fire. We're also installing cameras. We're going to be talking about all those things. So CORE is not just a local company. It was started in Bailey in 1938. Uh, with about 20 members, and we're now about 170,000 meters, and it 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 kind of wraps around all the south area of Denver. The towns of Castle Rock and Parker are directly in the core territory. So this is not just a small local concern. It's a uh, it's a one of the largest co-ops in the country. So as you can see, with the the areas, we basically have two areas, Woodland Park and Conifer, that are in the mountains and everything else are in the plains. So we do vegetation management and it's, uh, in some areas it's very expensive and some it's kind of cheap. In Bennett, it's kind of cheap. Cost about $336 a mile. In Woodland Park, it's getting expensive, just under $5,000 a mile. Sedalia, cost about 6100 and in Conifer, it's really expensive because we have a lot of nice mountains, a lot of nice trees. Cost about $9,200 per mile uh, to maintain the vegetation. And that is something the folks at CORE are deeply committed to. So one of the ways that we're doing that is actually using satellites. So what we're doing is we're contracting with a service that looks at our uh, power distribution areas and it looks, and you can actually see from, the, from outer space individual trees and trees that might be a problem. And we map our, our power lines overlaid on those problems. And it gives us an area that we need to look at. So we're, we started this about three years ago. This year we're going to end up with about 2,200 miles that have been looked at through the, um, through the satellites. Now that's 2,200 miles of distribution. CORE has about 6,500 miles. So we're getting to be about half that we've looked at so far. And remember, much of our area is in the, in the plains, which are less, less of a concern for wildfire issues. So this is what, the, uh, the, what they see from outer space. So the first they look at visible uh, light, which, is, which the trees show up primarily green. Then they look at infrared and the trees that are in trouble or dying show up as kind of a gray color and through artificial intelligence they can go in and identify that and then eventually make, create this heat map. So this is an area that was done just north of Woodland Park uh, and you can see there are areas of the red dots. 
Those are the areas of concern. Those are the areas that we know that we got to get on those and we have to put those at a higher priority. So rather than waiting uh, the normal six year cycle to do a, a vegetation inspection, we may do those a lot sooner. So another thing is when there are wind storms that are pro projected or pro that, are, um, that are forecasted and it combines with low humidity, high temperatures, you know the red flag days, we have the capability to change all the settings on, on the power lines that go to your neighborhoods. Now we change those and we make them much more sensitive. We also, instead of trying to reclose several times, we only we change it to a single reclose. And a reclose is when you've probably seen it, your power goes out and then a couple seconds later it comes back and everything's normal. That's a normal automatic protection setting that's on the power system. So what we do is we wait on the, on the red flag settings, we'll wait for 10 seconds and try it once. And if it doesn't stay in, then we have a problem, we're not gonna try it again. The goal there is to minimize the energy that's dumped into a perhaps fallen tree or fallen power line and minimize the likelihood of fire ignition. Now the result is you may have more frequent outages and I would rather have my power go out than my house burn. That's just me. Maybe, maybe you would disagree with that. Um, but the good thing is uh, CORE almost, I think we have about 200 people in CORE that don't have AMI meters, automatic metering infrastructure. And that's a big way to say CORE knows when your power goes out. It's, it's told immediately, so we don't have to wait for people to start calling and then start mapping all the calls the way we did it many years ago and say, oh, we must have this feeder out because we can tell by whose power's out. That's all automatic now. The power goes out to a neighborhood, CORE knows what, what meters are out, what meters don't have power, and they can identify that very quickly. And a result of that, our reliability numbers are doing great. We are, um, we basically beat Excel all the time with our reliability numbers, and we really shouldn't. Because our territory is much more difficult to maintain, and also our, it's so vast and, and lightly populated that a lot of times, you know, it may take 45 minutes for a truck just to get to an outage in our area. Now in Excel, they, if it's five minutes, that's too long. So, but despite all those problems, we still can beat them in reliability. So we're also relying now on, on cameras. First you mitigate with, with your tree mitigation service, then you um, try not to start a fire by changing all the settings on your power system. And if, God forbid, something does happen, whether it's man-caused or lightning or and the unfortunate event, a tree gets into a line, um, we're starting to put uh, cameras on all of our systems, on all of our communication towers, to look for these types of um, events, smoke plumes. We're starting now using artificial intelligence. We are doing a, a much more detailed job with artificial intelligence every six seconds. It's, uh, it's taking a look for smoke plumes. And that doesn't mean it's just from power power lines or anything like that. So we're excited about that. Fires are one of our biggest concerns. So we want to protect the infrastructure that you people own, that you folks own in the, in the power company. But more importantly, we want to protect your homes and our forests. So thank you very much. We'll be available afterwards to chat further. Thank you. And also, if you didn't know, um, CORE does have the director elections coming up on Saturday, I believe. Um, you can go online and um, vote there, okay? Um, but be sure and do that. It's very important. Um, okay, next, our um, Senator Mark Baisley may still be on the Senate floor tonight. Um, they were, I think, talking about assault 
weapon legislation, so that could take forever. Um, but Tammy Story, our um, representative from the State House Repre Representatives, is here, and she's going to talk to us a couple minutes about legislation. Thanks very much. It's great to be here tonight, and thanks so much to all of you for coming out. I'm Tammy Story. If you live nearby, I'm your state representative. I represent House District 25, which is the mountains of Jefferson County, south of I-70, and also a portion of southwest Littleton around the Chatfield High School articulation area. I serve on a few committees. I serve on uh, the Public Health and Behavioral Health uh, and Human Services Committee, as well as Ag, Water, and Natural Resources Committee. I'm also the chair of the Capital Development Committee, where we address the capital or construction needs of all of our state buildings, like the Capitol, um, our Department of Correction facil facilities, all of our uh, public institutions of higher ed, including our community colleges, and all of our state park buildings and their uh, roads. Uh, I also have served on the Wildfire Matters Review Committee, which meets in the interim during the summer. And I'm looking forward to serving on that committee again this summer. Um, I have run several bills um, along the way, a couple last year that were signed into law and currently are in process. And I have a couple more that I'm working on now that I look forward to being signed into law very soon. Um, there are sort of three categories that we are looking at when we're looking at running policy. It has to do with mitigation, suppression, and recovery. And I have some to share in each of those categories. Um, I had a bill that I ran last year that's a collaborative effort between the Colorado State Forest Service as well as the Division of Fire Prevention and Control and the U.S. Forest Service. It's being led by the Colorado State Forest Service to develop a robust um, program for education and promotion of wildfire mitigation efforts and Commissioner Dahl Kemper mentioned it a little bit ago when she was up here. It's for the month of May, it's a national program and if you want materials for like your local HOA meeting or some other meeting, um, you should see our volunteer firefighter uh, departments that are here tonight. If they don't have the materials yet, they will soon, or you can reach out to me. I'd be happy to get those to you. Um, also in the suppression realm, I worked on a bill last year that was signed into law to provide personal protective equipment for our volunteer firefighters. Just so you know, 85% of our firefighters across the state of Colorado are volunteers. They volunteer their time and risk their lives to protect ours and our property. So you should hug your volunteer firefighter on your way out tonight. Um, but this uh, grant program helps provide that personal protective equipment for firefighters, their, their pants, their jackets, their helmets, their gloves, boots, all of that. In many cases, they have to buy that out of their own pocket or at least a portion of it. Um, and this grant is, um, you know, trying to mitigate that and provide that the grant money is available for that equipment for them. Um, also was mentioned uh, Firehawk a little bit earlier, um, retrofitted military Blackhawk helicopter that turns into a Firehawk helicopter. It has a 1,000 gallon um, tank in the belly of the chopper and it's meant really for the initial um, outbreak of a fire to hit them really hard before they get big. Um, it has a hose that it can drop while it's hovering in flight and uh, just needs a body of water of 18 inches to suck up 1,000 gallons in about 90 seconds. Um, so pretty effective. We bought one a few years ago. We were looking for it to be available and on hand in a few months. And then we are purchasing a second one um, this year with this year's budget, that, which should be available in a couple more years. And then in the recovery realm, um, I am working on a bill to increase the number of fire investigators that we have. Uh, we only have one statewide fire investigator right now. And so we're looking to increase those numbers so that we have um, a better chance of identifying the cause of fires and being able to um, make whatever kind of adjustments that need to be made regarding to um, you know, what those causes were. And the final bill that I'm working on right now is a tree nursery bill. Um, Colorado State Forest Service has a tree nursery at Colorado State University campus. 
and it is old and decrepit and we are working to invest in it so it can be remodeled and expanded so that they can grow as many as two million seedlings a year to better um, provide seedlings so for reforestation after the devastating fires as well as uh, watershed restoration which is also a very important piece of recovery and have some probably left over to sell to other states that are also looking for seedlings for their fires and um, that will help make this um, program um, in this facility more financially self-sustaining. So I'm happy to chat with you about any of those things um, later this evening or reach out to me by email. Happy to chat with you. Thanks so much for being here. Okay, and our last speaker actually tonight um, is Bobby Baca. She's with the Colorado Department of Regulatory Agencies, or DORA. Um, she's with the Division of Insurance, Director of Property, Casualty, and Title. So, Bobby. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for having me back. I think this is my third time here. Um, so, I'm, I know we're very short on time, so I'm going to skip over this particular slide um, and go straight to some legislative um, activity right now. Um, if you were here in October, you heard Commissioner Conway speak about underinsurance and um, the uh, amount of underinsurance that the Marshall Fire survivors um, were, were realizing. And um, I think at that time he told you that there would be legislation, and that is House Bill 231174. Um, that particular piece of legislation is um, currently, I know it passed the House second reading yesterday. I hope it passed the third reading today and should be heading over to the Senate. Um, what that bill does is it creates um, an annual report on construction costs that the insurance companies will have to take into consideration when determining the value of a home. It also requires the insurance companies to offer increased coverage limits on your extended replacement cost and your ordinance and law. So current law requires they offer 20% of extended replacement cost coverage and 10% uh, ordinance and law coverage and this bill will increase that to 50% and 20% respectively. Um, and then it also requires the commission to prom commissioner to promulgate some rules with regard to um, notification of um, those coverage offers. The second bill that is making its way through right now, which passed second house reading today, is the Fair Access to Insurance Requirements Plan, and which is the FAIR plan. Um, Colorado is one of a handful of states that does not have a FAIR plan in place right now. This will create a board who will then establish the FAIR plan. And um, uh, like I said, it's working its way through the house. Hopefully it'll pass go through third readings tomorrow and hit the Senate um, on Friday, we're hoping. Um, so the FAIR plan, everybody, I've talked to several people here already that have talked about um, their homeowner's insurance being non-renewed, um, availability issues. I know I've talked to some several realtors um, regarding concerns with obtaining insurance. This will help, it won't be an end all, um, but if, if if this can capture some of those properties that cannot be insured for any reason, um, this fair plan will help. It won't be effective until January 1 of 2025, so there is some lag time, but um, hopefully it will provide some relief. Um, and the last thing, like I said, since we're running, running low, um, I, to talk about mitigation, I know several people have already mentioned it. Um, I think uh, Chief Sherlock had mentioned a 30-foot defensible space. Um, or, and insurance companies right now may require more than that um, to, to, to write your property. So you may be looking at 100 feet of defensible space or 200 feet if that's even possible. But the thing to sit, that I want to drive home is that mitigate, to create that defensible space because that will help um, for an insurance company to determine whether they're going to write you or not. On our website, we have an Are You Disaster Ready page. Um, talks about creating your go bag, I know other, others have already talked about that information, but it is also on our website. So again, thank you for having me back. And we'll be in the back to answer any questions if you have anything. Thank you, Bobby. So you've heard a lot of great information tonight. 
So are you ready for the next wildfire? I don't know if any of us are, but we can sure do a lot to make ourselves more prepared. So there are a lot of people here that we'd like to talk to tonight. Um, but first, I would like to thank again our sponsors of tonight's meeting, Mountain Metro Association of Realtors and Real Remax Alliance. So thank you both. And um, thank you to all the speakers, everybody that is here. Um, our community ambassadors didn't speak tonight, but they've got a table worth of all kinds of information. Please go up and talk to them and get as much as an information as you need. But please stick around, talk to everybody, um, and we'll see you next September. We don't have another town hall meeting until the third Wednesday of September next next September. So thank you so much for being here, and we hope you stick around and talk to everybody. Thank you.